Please, oh, I need, I need permission from you. Oh. Hey, what's up, students? It's me, Seth, and today I am speaking with Dr. John Campbell. Dr. John Campbell. The reason I'm speaking with Dr. John Campbell today, students, is because he's awesome. And the reason he's awesome is because he has been my go-to source for everything COVID-19 and getting real information, not sensationalized, but real stuff. And one of the problems that I've been seeing teenagers is that nobody is speaking to you. Nobody is telling you directly a message, a hopeful message, a positive message, a message that helps people to really understand the issues so that you can take action and not just feel like people are just telling you what to do, but so that you have a reason to buy into it and understand from somebody who actually knows what they're speaking of. So, Dr. John, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, Seth. Good, good to talk to you, mate. It's so good to have you here. And for the teenagers, you know, I know that you got a lot going on. Give us five minutes, listen to us for a couple minutes and see if this hooks you because I think it will. So sure. students, here's how I want to set this up. Your teenage brain students has a few interesting things that I want to set up for John here. Um, one thing about the teenage brain uh, is that it t you tend to be very risk tolerant. That means that you're willing to take risks, often unsafe risks that can put you in, in trouble. Now, if that risk tolerance is helping you take social risks in a good positive way or healthy risks, well, great. But in the case of what's going on now, a lot of students are taking very, very unsafe risks because the consequences are for, so far down the line. Number two, the teenage brain often isn't great at future thinking. What that means is that your teenage brain often isn't good at seeing the consequences of what's going to happen down the line, positively or not negatively. So often in my teenage brain and John's teenage brain, we didn't connect the dots very well at that age either. But you have to be honest with yourself about that so you can take the right action. Number three, your social brain is going crazy. And what I mean by that is your brain is supposed, supposed to be developing socially right now. You're trying to figure out where you, where you fit into the world and you're exploring all these different new people and you want to be with your friends more than anything, more than with your family, more. That is so important to your brain and your brain development right now. So it's, it's telling you very loud messages. Hey, go hang out with my friends. And number four, your lack of medical knowledge, just because you haven't studied medicine. So those four things in the teenage brain are things that I, I want to put forth to you um, as we start this conversation. And John, what I feel like teenagers need is they need to not just be told by parents or teachers, hey, just do this, but they need to really understand the why. And the reason why it's so important to me is because, as I told you before, I had ARDS where my lungs shut down for nine days, and I experienced this personally, and I could very well not be here on Earth today, and I'm very lucky. Um, so, And I work with young people, so I really want you and I to give a message to them. Sounds so, good. All right. Yeah. You ready for my first question? Yeah, let's go for it. Can I what? just say, Seth, I have problems yeah. with many of those things myself still. <laughs> yeah. Quite a few of them I have ongoing issues with. It's maybe worse when you're younger. It gets a little better when you get older, but they don't go away completely. So even Seth probably has some slight difficulties in this area. I know I do for sure. A lot. That's why I do what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's start with this question. Why should people listen to you? Who are you? They've never seen you before. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. You know, whenever we, someone says anything, you should always say, well, what's your evidence for that? Not just accept things on face value. Because you get people talking all sorts of stuff and people are mouthing off about things they don't know about. So I'll tell you about me, then that'll give you a bit of a clue. So when I was eight, um, I'm, give me, I'll, I'll tell you, let, I'll let you into a secret now. I'm uh, 62. So don't tell anyone else though. Uh, now, when I was 18, I was a student psychiatric nurse. I did that for three or four years. And then I learned to be a, an RN, a general nurse, and I did that for a few years. And then I did various jobs, like I worked on an intensive care unit, and I worked on a coronary care unit, and I worked on a medical ward. And then I went overseas and worked in Thailand in refugee camps in the Thai Khmer border for a while. And then I came back and I started doing, I did some more clinical work, but then I started doing academic studies as well. And I realized I wanted to be a teacher. So I did various academic qualifications. Then I did a, full, I did a year to be a teacher of nurses. So I did a year's full-time course, similar to the courses your teacher would do. And I finished that in 1989 and I started teaching in 1990. Now, if you talk to your parents, they might just about remember those days. It's a long time ago. 
I know I taught, taught nurses for 27 years. So I've trained up student nurses to be RNs for a long, long time. And I've taught a few medical students and a few advanced nurses and nurse practitioners along the way as well. And I, I finished work a few years ago. And uh, for the last three years, up until last year, I was working in a, an, an emergency department as a staff nurse. I was putting on bandages and giving injections again. So I've been basically teaching and studying this stuff for 42 years now, I'm afraid. Slightly one, more, 44 years actually. And one of the things I really like about your experience base is that as, as you convey messages about what's going on with coronavirus on YouTube, I've, I've looked at a lot of your YouTube videos and you look at all sorts of body systems. So I, used, I taught science and one of the things I taught was body systems and they all work together. And I really like that. I feel like I can trust that you're coming from a perspective where you have seen so many different types of things in, in the medicine world that you can give us clarity. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think it's very important to understand how the body works. So I spent a lot of time studying how the body works and I did a biology degree to kind of get into the science of that a bit more. And I've taught how the body works for quite a long period of time. And most of the time, especially when you're young and even into middle life, the body works really well. It's the most amazing piece of kit it's possible to imagine. And having studied it for 44 years, I don't really understand it. I understand little bits, but not really at all. But the bits you do understand is let you realize how cool and amazing the whole thing is. But of course, sometimes it goes wrong and the normal function of the body goes wrong. And when it goes wrong, you get a disease. That's what disease is. It's abnormal body function. So what I've always tried to do is link the way the body works normally with how it goes wrong, with how that makes people feel, with how you recognize that. So I think that's a really important thing to do, as Seth said, to understand the science behind it. And then the other thing that's fascinating, of course, is the way that people work together because you are a social creature. Humans are intrinsically social. We work together in groups, we work together in packs, we work together in tribes, we work together in countries. It's just the way we work. Whole parts of your brain are just designed to allow you to interact with other people. So the way we interact is also important and that leads to other health outcomes. So the way that people work together in groups, or indeed if they don't work together in groups, that causes adverse health outcomes. So if they work against each other in something like a war, a lot of people get hurt. But if you work together collaboratively to help each other, then a lot of people get helped. So by people working together, your nation put people on the moon. You can do amazing things if we work together. So that's what we really have to strive for, working together, doing this as a team. This is a team effort. That's what we're working on, guys. Awesome. That, that's an amazing setup. Amazing. Thank you. I like the way you give a really big picture context for this. So the next question is really my only question. And then I have a list of a bunch of small questions that students have been asking. But my next question is the big one where we can really dive in for several minutes or however long you want. Yeah. Why should young people be taking this seriously? And how should they be taking it seriously? Especially given that they are often getting mixed messages from media, from government, from parents, from teachers, from friends. How, so the question was, why should they take it seriously? And what does that look like? How should they? Absolutely. There's so many reasons for taking this seriously. Let's make one really simple one, first of all. Now, it's true that the more illnesses someone has, the more likely they are to be severely affected by this COVID-19 disease. And it's also true that if I get this disease and you get this disease, I'm a much, much, much more likely to get a serious disease than you and much more likely to die. But young people can get this disease. They do get this disease and they can get it seriously. So there are tragic cases of young people that have died of this disease. So in my country, I know of a 15 year old and a 19 year old that were previously healthy, have got this disease and tragically, they're no longer with us. So self-interest is one good reason. You are not immune because you're young. You'll catch the disease at the same rate as anyone else. Everyone catches the disease. It's a virus. It just goes into the eyes. It goes into the mouth. It goes into the nose, down into the lungs. Everyone can get it. But young people tend to get it less severely. Young people are less likely to die. But in medicine, there's never any guarantees. You could get this disease and you could die. Now, having said that, I don't want to freak you out. 
because your chances of dying are remarkably low. So for example, if you're a teenager watching this, your chances of dying are about 0.02%, about two or three in, uh, in, in thousands would possibly die from it. In my age group, my chances of dying are 3.6%. So I'm about, about a couple hundred times more likely to die from it than you are. But the key thing is the virus spreads from person to person. This, this is a virus. No one can see it. It's way smaller than a bacterium. It's the smallest infectious thing really that we know of, apart from a few rogue proteins, but it's a really tiny thing. And it's, it's going everywhere at the moment. We have now what we call a pandemic. So you've probably heard of an epidemic where there's an outbreak in a particular area. This is a pandemic. Pan means everywhere. This is global. And what this means is this is a fight that all humanity is in. So if you're a member of the human race, you are enlisted in this fight, basically, whether you like it or not, because this is humanity v the virus. Now, make no mistake, this virus is the enemy and the enemy is trying to kill us. And in fact, it is, has already killed quite a lot of us. This is a wartime situation. It's absolutely serious. And the key thing is, even if you don't get a bad disease, if you're out socializing with your friends or you're out walking with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or you're in a class or something, you get this virus, then there's maybe something like a 50% chance that you won't get any symptoms at all. And there's an 80, 90% chance you'll get a very, very mild disease. In fact, there's only a few percent chance you're going to get really quite sick with it. So you might be okay. And I can never guarantee that. As we've said, there is a chance. But the key thing is you will take it home to your household. So your brothers and sisters can catch it. And there's an off chance that they might get a serious disease. Or if you've been out with your friends and you had it, you can give it to them or they can give it to you. Or if you take it home and you've got a parent or two parents at home, then you can give it to them. Even bigger risk is if you come into contact with older people, you can give it to them. And there's a real chance that they're going to die of this. Now, you've probably seen a game called Russian Roulette. It's on Rambo movies. And you put one bullet in the chamber and you spin the chamber and you pull it and see if it clicks. Now, that's putting your own life at risk. For you, there's a very small chance of that. But would you put one bullet in the chamber, spin it, point it at your granddad's brain and then pull that trigger to see if it clicked or not? Because that's what you're doing. You're playing Russian roulette with people's lives and we have to move forward in this together. The whole point about being a social animal like you are, the whole point about interacting with others is we, we look after weaker people. This is what a civilization is. You can gauge the quality of a civilization by how it looks after its weakest members. And let me tell you, I'm one of the weaker members because I'm older. You're one of the stronger members because you're younger. But I'd rather stick around for another couple of years and do some, make some more videos. I don't want to die just yet if I can avoid it. If I have to, I have to. But I don't have to die of this because people can be careful. So what we have to do is realize that my health depends on everyone else. Your health depends on everyone else because this is contagious. It spreads around. We have to look after each other. I hope I'm, go you're gonna, I'm gonna look after you, Seth's looking after you. I hope you're gonna look after me. I hope you're gonna look after Seth. Look after each other, team effort. Now, how we do this is another interesting point. Now, this virus spreads in different ways. The most common way, the easiest way for this virus to spread is when I'm breathing, I'm breathing out some of this virus if I'm infected. If I'm coughing, I'm coughing out even more of this virus. And if I'm sneezing, I'm coughing out lots of this virus as well and projecting it for quite a long way, you know, maybe 20 feet away from where I am at the moment. So if I'm just talking to you and you're talking to me a normal social distance apart, then you can get that virus that I am breathing out in your mouth, in your nose, or in your eyes, and that can cause infection in you. So that's the main way it's spread. The other way it's spread is in smaller air droplets called aerosols through coughs and sneezes. And that can be, as I say, more than six feet away. So if you're talking to someone within five or six feet, you can still catch it. If you're one foot away, you're even more likely to catch it. But if you cough or sneeze, it can be 10 feet, 20 feet away that it can spread through the air, especially in stuffy environments. So if you're talking to a friend, not that you, we, we can't really talk to friends at the moment, but if you are and they're, they're like 20, 30, 40 feet away outside, then that's much safer than being in a close, stuffy environment inside because the virus can hang in the air. 
So meeting people inside is the most dangerous thing. Because the other thing about this virus, stagnant. sorry, because the air is more stagnant in an absolutely, place. absolutely, Seth. The, the, the virus can hang in the air for a period of time. Now, there's debate about how, how long that time is, but it can be hours. So if you're in a very stuffy room and someone has got the virus and you're in a stuffy room with them, then the virus is much more likely to be spread. This is one reason we should keep rooms well ventilated and open the windows if someone's sick. So it's spread in that way, but mostly, mostly by these close-up droplets, but also further through the air as well. Now, when I'm breathing now, lots of and speaking now, little droplets are coming out of my mouth. And these droplets can have the virus in them. And if I cough or sneeze, even more of these droplets with even more of the virus can come out. And what these do is they settle onto a surface. So it could be a, a door handle, it could be a bench, it could be a worktop, it could be anything. The viruses will settle onto that surface. And then if you touch that surface, the virus can go from that surface and now your hand is contaminated with that virus. And then if that virus goes to your mouth, your nose or your eyes, that can make you become infected. This is why hand washing is so absolutely vital. So watch these hand washing videos that are there and learn how to wash your hands properly. Keep your hands clean, wash all the different parts of your hands. You know, the videos that show you how to wash your hands. That's really important. And the, there's another way that this, so that's in the air is the main way. Well, can I recap? And contaminated surface is the second one. So, on, I, so I can breathe and I'm just normally breathing. I don't know that I have it because I've somehow got, I don't have any symptoms, but the virus I have, I have gotten the virus in my nose, mouth, or eyes. I don't even know it. It's a week later and it's been hanging out. My body has noticed it. And I'm a young person and my body has said, oh, we're going to take care of these viruses and my body's killing them off and I'm going to be fine. But I don't know if I'm going to be fine or not. I don't even know what's going on. I barely have any symptoms. Maybe I have, what, a little cough or a runny nose one day or a little headache. Or maybe even not, maybe nothing. Or nothing. But mm, it's there quite possible. in me. It's in my body. Absolutely. And I'm exhaling and it's coming out or sneezing or coughing. It's coming out of me. And my phone's on the table and it's heavy. I remember oh. you saying it was heavy and the virus lands. You said yeah. settles. The virus yeah. eventually lands on my yeah. phone or my table or uh, wherever. I don't, you can't see it or anything. No, no. It says, hey, can I use your phone? Hand in my phone, you know. Absolutely. It, th th these are filthy things. Keep them clean. Always wipe them with antiseptic wipes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and just in normal speech, the virus can spread between three and six feet between individuals. Literally right now, as you and I are talking, yep. we don't even see the air because yep. it, it, the, first of all, the droplets in our air right now are so small, but the virus is even smaller than the droplets coming out of my Absolutely. breathing or your breathing. The, the, like Ab so much smaller, it's incomprehensible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Seth is 100% right on that. So this is, a, this is an, an invisible enemy. This is why it's so dangerous. Can you imagine fighting the invisible man? You know, he's got a bit of an edge on you. And this is kind of, this is kind of the situation we're in. <laughs> now, there's a third way that this can spread that not many people know about. And it can spread in stools. That's when you go to the toilet for a poo. So it, 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 the virus is excreted in your poo. Then when you flush the toilet, it can flush up into the air. And that means that toilets can be very dirty places, especially if they're shared toilets like public toilets and when you say so you've got to really go be careful to wash your hands air. after that again mm -hmm. it's, again it's invisible when it goes yeah. up into the air it's not like you, it's a normal flushing of the toilet we don't see anything it That's appears right. to go all down the toilet but it's aerosolized it and we need to yeah. understand that this is happening <clears throat> yeah okay and people have done this they did a lot of studies on this in china where they went into toilets they took samples from the surface and they found the virus there. And it can hang around on those surfaces for about three days as well. So even if someone had used that toilet a couple of days before who had the virus, you've still got a risk of catching it from your hands as long as you're not, as, you have to be really careful. Get your hands clean and then when you leave the toilet, use the tissue that you dried, that you dried your hands with to open the toilet door if you can. Got to be thinking about these hygiene things all the time. So that's how it spreads. So really okay. what we have to do Can I to stop it being spread is, is to make sure we're not close to people. We need to be physically separated for a period of time. And 
I guess I'm sort of backtracking on this question, but do I remember you saying that a virus is not even alive? That's, that's a really good question, Seth. And so then we the have follow up to that is after three days, did it die? Did it lose activity? What happened in those three years? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, th this particular virus has got what you call genetic material right in the middle of it. RNA. It's got a strand of RNA in the middle of it. That's surrounded by a bit of protein. That's surrounded by a fatty bit. Now, when it goes onto a surface, the proteins will actually degrade over a period of time. And that will mean that the RNA in the virus is no longer viable. Now, we can't really say that viruses are alive. So I'm alive, dogs are alive, plants are alive, even bacteria are alive because they can divide and reproduce on their own. So theoretically, you could drop a couple of bacteria off on Mars, come back in a billion years time and they'd still be there because they can, as long as there's something for them to eat and drink, they, they, can, they can reproduce themselves. Viruses can't. Viruses are absolute parasites. They only reproduce inside living cells. They can't make their own energy. So they're not really alive. They're just this chemical machine. They're, they're scallywags. They're fiendishly clever, fiendishly complicated, but actually not really alive because Sorry. they can't make their own energy. In a sense, really, a virus only comes alive when it's inside one of your cells, infecting your cells. It takes over your cell's energy, and then it kind of becomes alive while it's reproducing itself inside your cells. So, so the answer to the question, Seth, is that the viruses will actually, in a sense, decompose over a period of a few days. Just like if you leave a piece of meat in, on a bench, it's going to go off in a few days. It's much the same as that. The proteins will degrade, but it's not really alive. So we're almost fighting a zombie enemy here. This is, so this, is, this, is, this is an attack of invisible zombies. So in a way, that's good news based on the, where you were getting to in the discussion before I interrupted you, because the social distancing means that if we have enough of it, they just will not be Absolutely. Able to, uh, the, to the, the only way this virus can spread is in living cells, your living cells. So the virus will get into a living cell. It will infect that cell. It will reproduce inside that cell. It will give out billions of copies of itself. And then we will cough those out onto the next person. But over the course of about a week, if you're infected, you'll make immunity to that virus. These are called antibodies. They are the defense mechanism of the body. And then your body will eradicate that virus. It will go away completely. Now, if that virus has not had the time to skip to one of your friends in that time, then that is that line of the virus, dead, gone, finished. So if everyone did this, if everyone isolated, then the virus would be in people that were infected now, but then these people that are infected now would eradicate the virus. A few of them would die, unfortunately, and the virus would die with them. So if we could stop that virus from spreading, then this disease would go away completely in just a few weeks. If we could stop all of the spread of this virus, and that's what we have to do. We have to reduce our social distancing so we stop this virus from spreading. And then it will die all of its own. Now, that's not going to happen. It sounds good in theory, but it's not really going to happen. This virus is going to go on spreading. So we're going to have to be doing this for some time. But the more we can reduce the way this virus spreads, the less people will get it at any particular time. Because if lots of people get this virus all at the same time, then over a population, about 16% will get really fairly sick with this virus. And about 5 or 6% will get critical. That means they are not going to make it unless they get pretty advanced medical treatment. So the big, big cheese in my country just now, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of England, he is in an intensive care unit because he's ill. He's, he's in this 16% or getting towards this 5 or 6% of people that are critical. Now, that's OK. He's getting oxygen, he's getting treatment, and you know, hopefully he'll pull through. God willing, he'll pull through this. But suppose 10 million people got sick all at the same time, or 100 million people got sick all at the same time, as could happen, because the virus can double. The amount of people infected with this virus can double every three, four days if we let it. Then that means that if you've got 10 million people and 16% of them get sick, that's going to be like a huge number. And we just don't have enough hospital places to treat all these people all at the same time. And if they don't get hospital treatment, that means a lot of them are going to die. It's as simple as that. 
So what this means is by spreading the virus, if I spread the virus, other people might die. It really is that simple. This is like a war situation. Now, I don't know if you were brought up on war stories, but when I was a kid, it was after the Second World War and people were brought up on war stories. And that generation were called out to go and fight, to save lives by fighting, to rescue the world from the, the tyranny that was there. You're called to save lives by staying at home. You're called to save lives by not seeing your girlfriend, by not seeing your boyfriend. You're called to save lives by not sneaking out with your mates, your friends. You're called to save lives by not going to a party. That's all you gotta do. Now, I'm not saying that's easy, but it's, it's easier than someone shooting at you. Every generation has its challenge. And this is the challenge of your generation. The challenge of your generation is to maintain social distance for a period of time. And then, hey, when we get back together, it's going to be all the much more fun when we can. But for now, we can't. For now, this is dead serious. People's lives depend on your behavior. It is that simple. Don't let us down, guys. And I think one of the scary things about this is that they anybody we can transmit it and never even know so we can transmit it to someone who transmitted to someone who is affected and who does not make it and uh we would never even know and i think that's absolutely really so so you could infect your mum who infects your granddad who infects a friend of your grandmother's and that person could die and you might never know you've had an illness but this virus will think, ah, I haven't made, I, the virus will think, oh, I haven't made that guy ill, but I tell you what, he's going to transmit it to that guy, he's going to transmit it to that guy, and I'm going to kill that guy. When I get to him, I'm going to kill him. This, is what, this virus is a killer, and you might never know. So when you look back on this, you've got to look back and say, you know, you know what, that year 2020, the year of the pandemic when I was a kid, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when you're old, 60, 70 years ago, you're going to think, you know, you know what I did? I did the right thing. Yeah. No one died because I was being stupid. I yeah. did the right thing. It's interesting that you say that because I've thought a lot about that. Students, you all are going to, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you're going to be looking back on this and you're going to say, do you remember that pandemic in 2020? Yeah. You're going to be telling your families about it. And Absolutely. Uh, but you are i'm just going to move this camera a bit because the sun's out that's it 2020 are. is going to be the year of the pandemic absolutely this is always going to be remembered now when i was young i learned about a pandemic in 1918 1919 just over 100 years ago and that was an influenza pandemic it was a bit similar to this but a different virus and the news is on that that no one knows now how many people that killed but it was between 50 million and 100 million people died in that pandemic. Now, that was the last big one. And this has been a big part of this problem. You know, you might have known what the word pandemic meant. You might have been able to write it on a whiteboard or a blackboard and say, pandemic, this means a global outbreak of disease. But to actually live through this and to actually experience this and to see how destructive a pandemic can be and to see people around you dying, that's a different experience. So this is... 2020 is forever going to be known as the year of the great pandemic. Absolutely it is. And you need to look back with pride and satisfaction that you did the right thing in this pandemic, as I'm trying to do, as I know Seth is trying to do. And it is hard. It is so oh, it's, hard. it's tough. It's tough. I mean, Seth said, you know, as a human being, even when you're old, it's still true. But, you, you know, you're still desperate yeah. to communicate with other people. You know, it was really hard to stop shaking hands, to stop giving people a hug. But we just have to do this for a period of time. So you want to socialize. But as well as that, it's not so much that you want to socialize. People have to know that you want to socialize. So if you want to spend time with someone, that's good. And it means the world, if you know, they want to spend time with you. So we can still let our friends know that, yeah, I'd love to be spending time with you. But hey, for now because I don't want you to get sick, because I don't want to kill your parents, because I don't want to kill your grandparents, I can't spend time with you. But you can still give them the satisfaction that you know that they know you want to spend time with them. And that's really important. So the mere fact that we can't see each other physically is maybe less important than the motivation. Yeah. So tell your friends you'd love to be with them. 
and they might say the same to you who knows but that means that they know that they are important to you and that's important as well and I think for you young people watching too, I think one real practical thing that you might want to do is think of a, a sentence or a phrase that you're going to say to your friends that says that, hey, I would love to hang out with you, but I'm, I'm just trying to take care of everybody. Like you have to frame it in a way that sounds strong because there's going to be, to be a lot of social pressure on you. And some of you feel fine being assertive and saying, no, I don't, I'm not even doing that, sorry. But some of you feel that social pressure more than others and you may feel really pressured that if they say oh come on everything's fine but for you to be the leader and to stand up and say you know what i'd love to and to have your words thought out i just want to recommend that to young people because i think yeah you know, write, write a sentence down so you got it ready that's a really good idea seth and when your friends say to you come around i'm fine they don't know that mm -hmm. they may be fine they may not be fine in the United States at the moment, there's a very good chance they will not be fine because you've got a big pandemic in your country as I have in mine. Serious stuff, guys. So this brings up a question. Let's say that it's six months, a year, two years down the line, um, and we want to know, did we ever, did it ever come through us? Did COVID-19 come into me and I never had a symptom and I probably have immunity now? Is there something called an antigen or antibody test? Absolutely, yep. Be yep. able to know that in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two terms you need to learn a bit of science here. One is antigen, and the antigen is an antibody generating molecule. So the antigen is the virus. The antigen is the virus. Now, when you're exposed to the virus, that is when you are exposed to the antigen, your body, yeah, that's the antigen, fantastic. So the antigen is the virus. Remember that, the antigen is the virus. It's against us. And when your body is exposed to a virus, it will make an antibody. So the antigen is the virus, that's the bad guy. The bad guy causes your body to make the good guy which is, so the antigen, sorry, the bad guy, causes your body to make the good guy, which is the antibody. So the antibody is the body that kills the antigen. So antibody, absolutely. So the antibody is made by your body to kill the antigen. And it will do so. That's why you get better. And this is really clever because you have this really complicated virus thing. And your body learns to make this really complicated protein and it kills it, gets rid of it. Now, it gets rid of the virus, so the virus is gone, but the antibody will be left in your blood. Now, we don't know for how long this antibody is left in your blood. Now, some antibodies stay in your blood for six months, some stay for a year, some stay for two years, some stay for 10 years, some stay for 20 years, some stay for life. And we don't know with this particular one. So like I had a vaccine for hepatitis, and I got tested 20 years later, and I was still immune. I still had the antibody for hepatitis. But with this virus, because it's a new virus, we don't know. But what it does mean at some point in the future, say a year's time, maybe two years time, we would expect that you can get a blood test. And then if you had that anti, if you got that antibody, then you'll know I had the virus. Now, these, the governments are buying millions of these antibody tests. We're working flat out on it now. Now, a lot of governments have come pretty late to the party on testing, but we are catching up. So all the governments in the world now are working on antibody tests. So in a year's time, you can get the antibody test. If it's negative, that means you've never had the illness. But in a year's time, when you get tested, there's a good chance that you will have that antibody and you'll better look back and say, you know what, I had that. I hope I didn't spread it to anyone else. So yeah, you're right, Seth, by this antibody testing, we'll be able to see where the virus has been. Another way to think about it is the antibodies are like footsteps that the virus has left in the sand or in the mud. You can see where it's been. The virus itself will be gone, but you can see where it's been. So at some point in the future, yeah, you should get to find out. Hope it's not too long. I hope we get massive testing soon, but yeah, for sure you can find out. Yeah. But not this week. So this has been great, John. Let's go through. I have some sort of rapid fire questions. You yeah, can yeah. Take them real quick and then yeah. we'll wrap up. Um, so, um, and these are questions from families or students. Um, how can I tell if the symptoms that I have are COVID-19 or coronavirus or something else? That's really difficult. The only way to be sure is to get the test. 
But if you get a new cough or a different cough and a persistent cough, that's a pretty strong feature. Or if you get a fever, that's another pretty strong feature. Or if you get diarrhea, or if you start feeling ill, or if you get achy muscles. Or another strange one is people often lose the sense of smell or the sense of taste. So any of those features, you would have to assume that you have it and isolate yourself for at least seven days after that. Now, seven days after that, the antibody should have kicked out the virus and on eight, day, eight days after that, you should be okay to go back out again, as long as you're feeling better. But if you have any of these symptoms, you have to assume you have it and isolate yourself. And you'll find out if your chances of getting a test for the virus aren't that good because we're short of uh, antigen tests. But in a few months time or a year's time, you'll be able to get a definitive diagnosis because people will be able to look for the antibodies. Okay. But for now, we have to assume these symptoms are the disease and isolate ourselves just in case. Okay. Another question was, please explain how this virus is different from the flu and why it seems to be so much more contagious. Absolutely. So the flu is actually caused by influenza type of virus. It's a particular type of virus. And the COVID-19 is actually caused by a completely different family of viruses called the coronaviruses. So there's other viruses already. For example, you might have heard of uh, herpes virus. It can cause cold sores, for example. That's a different type of virus. So there's many different types of viruses. They infect different cells and they affect the body in different ways. So influenza is a respiratory virus. It does affect the lungs and things. And it does give you a fever, but it makes you sick in a slightly different way to the coronavirus. And as well as that, the coronavirus is more infectious than ordinary flu. So it's spread around quicker than a flu pandemic would and it causes different symptoms. And it's got a higher case fatality rate with coronavirus. So most people who get influenza, you can feel pretty sick for a week or so, then you get better. Very, very few people die of influenza. Some do, but not too many. Whereas the death rate with the coronavirus is much higher. That's why it's so dangerous. Life is much more at risk with the coronavirus. And one thing that I think is going to come to people's minds right now is when you said some do, but very few, is that in the news, can you clarify when you say very few? Because in the news, some people were saying, you know, hey, the flu kills way more people. And yeah. yeah, the flu does kill a lot of people because very many people have it. And every winter, there's a huge flu outbreak. And it kills mostly older people with weakened immune systems who have other diseases. So flu is a big problem, not so much because it's a very dangerous disease. It's a very unpleasant disease, but it's a problem because it's such a widespread disease. And even although it only kills maybe 0.1%, like one in a thousand of the people that infects, because there's a lot of flu, then the death rate can be quite high. So initially, people were saying, look, flu is a big problem, kills lots of people. This coronavirus doesn't kill many people. But we now know that the coronavirus has got a much higher death rate and many more people get seriously ill with coronavirus. And now coronavirus is becoming as common as flu. So if we don't take steps to stop the spread of coronavirus, then about 80% of the population could be infected with it. And it's a huge problem. And of course, this is as well as flu, not instead of. Flu hasn't gone away. This is an extra problem that we've now got to deal with as well as flu. Um, so let's see. Another one was, okay, what about hugs, handshakes, sharing a cup, um, high-fiving, holding hands, things like that? Because you said aerosolized where yeah. if you cough or sneeze <clears throat> and it's floating around the air and it gets in your eyes. And, and I do want to ask too, why if the virus gets in your eye or nose or mouth, what's happening? Is, is it sticking to the liquid in the eye and then traveling yep. into the bloodstream or what? Yep. Let, 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 let's do that one first. So if the virus gets into your eyes or your nose, then you know if you're upset and you're, and you're crying. Huh? If you're upset and you're crying, then you get a runny nose, don't you? That's because the tears from your eyes drain into your nose. And then you sniff and swallow that and it goes back into the back of your mouth, a bit called the pharynx where you swallow it. And all these surfaces inside from your nose all the way down to your lungs is one continuous surface. So once the virus gets into there, it can spread down this continuous surface. 
So actually from your eyes, all the way down to the bottom of your lungs is one continuous surface and the virus can spread from the mouth, the nose and the eyes. And these things are lined by what we call mucous membranes. So that's like in, in the inside of your mouth, it's a mucous membrane. So whereas your skin is not. So if you get the virus on your hands, it's not going to infect you through your skin because the skin is virus proof. At least it's proof to this virus. But then if your hands go to your mouth or your nose, it can easily get into your mucous membranes and then down into your lungs from there. So that's the answer. Everything's all kind of joined up. What was the first question, Seth? I've forgotten. Okay, so then um, uh, high fives, handshake. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sharing a drink. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, right, so if I, if I cough, or if someone, I'm going to get the virus on my hands. Or if someone else coughs, so if someone coughs on my phone, I touch my phone, then the virus is now on my hands. I shake hands with you, I high five with you, then the virus is now on your hands. And then it can go to your mouth. The virus can then reproduce inside you and you can then spread that to other people. Hugs. When you hug someone, you're very close. They, they, you are breathing in the air they have exhaled. So you're sharing air basically because you're close. Kissing would be even worse. Kissing is the worst thing to do at the moment. So all of these things that involve close physical contact, especially the touching, can spread the virus. Skin to skin can spread the virus from the infected person's skin into the mouth, into the eyes, into the lungs, and then onto other people. So this is why we need this physical separation, just for a period of time, but for now, for sure, we need it. So you said something, you kind of said it really quick, but I think that it's something that I haven't seen covered a lot from the experts. But basically, so you let's say you're walking and you walk <laughs> through some yep. of the virus and it gets in your eyes, you're inhaling, it gets in your nose. At that point, these are little, I don't know if the, is the word molecules of the virus? The, 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 the viral particles or virions. Okay. So you get a bunch of viral powder particles, maybe it's 10, maybe it's thousands, I don't know. We don't really know that, right? Um, well, we don't know this for sure, but if you get influenza, the flu virus in your lungs, then three viral particles can be enough to cause the infection. Wow, that's we, a viral we, load, right? Uh, that's the viral load, yeah. More now, now if your immune system, if, if that's in your immune system, load, it, a, few, a few viral particles can cause it. With this virus, we don't know. What does seem to be the case with this virus is the more viral load people have, the sicker they seem to get. Okay. So they but get he, many more cells infected all at once and they seem to get sicker. But again, we're not okay. 100% sure about that yet. Okay, so you get some of the viral particles into you yeah. and then they, once they're in you, they find a cell. They, they, go, they, 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 they affect cell the cells they, down in the bottom of the lungs. Okay, so they find cells in the bottom of the lungs and they get inside of them. Then they Absolutely. replicate, then they break, and then they go to other cells and that's how it really That's, that's right. And as, as well as that, they go into the lining of your lungs. So when you breathe and cough out, the virus is going to be coughed up and breathed out from the lining of your lungs. Absolutely, Seth. That's what happens. Got it. And so I, as I mentioned before we started the call, so students, I, I was in a coma and I had ARDS, which is like SARS, where it's called adult respiratory distress syndrome, where my lungs were attacked by some virus. This was a long time ago and we don't really know what attacked me, but something attacked me. I was in a coma for nine days. I couldn't breathe on my own. So I, 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 was, so I was what was called intubated. So the people that uh, John was talking about and that 5%, the critical ones, are usually intubated, which means that they stick tubes into you to keep you alive, to breathe for you. So John, what, seem, what I seem to understand is that in my lungs, there's all this infection and my body is trying to fight the infection with white blood cells and things that fight infections. But the problem is that those things that are fighting off the infection in the alveoli, in the parts of the lungs that want air and gas, it's fluid. So if you can't exchange gas, if you're inhaling, but there's fluid, you're essentially, I, I've, and I felt like I was essentially suffocating on my own breathing. Is that an accurate? Yeah, that, that, that's right, Seth. So, you know, if you fall over and twist your ankle, your ankle kind of swells up, doesn't it? Because you get fluid round about the ankle joint. Now that swelling is called inflammation. Inflammation. So damaged tissues or damaged parts of the bodies get inflammation. Or well, if someone hits you on the face, you get a big red blotch there. That is called inflammation. 
And this inflammation causes fluid to leak out from the blood vessels. So in your lungs, you might know you have these air sacs, millions of them, billions of them inside your lungs. And if you open them all out, you'd have like 100 square meters, like three, four, 900 square feet or something Again, in, 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 inside yeah. your lungs. So you have these air sacs. Now, if there's inflammation in there, then fluid comes out with inflammation. Then these little air sacs will fill up with fluid. So normally the oxygen gets in through these air sacs, like my pen here, it gets in. So no, sorry, the oxygen goes from inside to outside. The oxygen goes out like that into the blood. So normally the oxygen goes from the air sacs out into the blood because the blood is surrounding these air sacs. And of course the carbon dioxide has got to get from the blood back into these air sacs. Right. But that can only work if there's air in these air sacs. Now, this inflammation because of the disease, just like your ankle going swollen, then these will go swollen as well, but the fluid is nowhere to go. So the fluid fills up these, these gaps, these air spaces, and the gases can't move. The oxygen can't move through the fluid because it's full of water. So it's a bit like drowning in a way. So, so what Seth had, he had something called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And in there, that's exactly what happens. So these air sacs, so that, there's the air sac that's in your lung, like that. And normally, the oxygen goes out, like that. The oxygen is going out into the blood roundabout, and the carbon dioxide is going back from the blood into your lungs for you to, to breathe out. But if these fill up with fluid, like this, and that's what happens, they fill up with fluid, and now the oxygen can't get through the fluid because you're full of water. It's a bit like drowning. And I'm delighted to say you've made a recovery from the time you had it, Seth. But it is, it is a life-threatening condition. Acute respiratory distress syndrome. And also, there's another disease called pneumonia, which you can get as a complication of this as well. And that's pretty bad news as well. Both of these are immediate life-threatening conditions. And this is why some people deteriorate. And as well as that, the virus can sometimes affect other organs, such as the heart, as well as the lungs. Okay. Uh, next rapid fire question. You said if you open the windows in the place where you're at, that can help dilute it, especially if yeah. somebody in the room or house is sick. Yeah. Um, but are you also opening the windows? Is that letting it in? No. Because no, I think we can you. fairly safely say that is not the case. This does not blow from house to house in the air, no. It is not airborne in that way. It's only airborne through the droplets. Okay. So plenty of fresh air is not going to let the virus in, but it will let the virus out. But the virus that you let out is going to be diluted everywhere else, and that's not going to infect other people. As long as you are physically separated from other people, they're going to be safe. So if you're so walking fresh down air is always good. So if you're walking by someone walking down the street, as long as you're pretty far, far enough from them, six, six, 10 feet, it's yep. most likely going to be falling. You're not going to walk right if through. You, if, you're six to, if you're walking past someone six to 10 feet away, you're both safe. Okay. The virus is sufficiently diluted not to infect you and or for you to infect them. And, to be, and that's outdoors, to be clear. Outdoors, yeah. Okay. Indoors, it's much more likely because the air's rebreathed and there's droplets in the air. What if someone I know gets sick, what do I do for them and me and my people? That, yeah, that's a good question. If someone gets sick, then I think the best thing to do is keep them warm. Now, very often when people get a virus and they get a temperature, they'll take Tylenol or they'll take ibuprofen to try and bring the temperature down. Now, some people recommend that, but for you, if you are otherwise healthy and you're over the age of 12, I think if you're getting a fever, you're best just to let, the, let go with that and the body will heal itself because we know people will heal quicker if their body temperature is higher. Ironically, now, and co contrary to popular belief. It, it, it is. Fever is a very natural defense mechanism. Dogs get fever. Camels get fever. All animals get fever when they're sick. It's a natural defense mechanism. Now, you'll feel pretty bad for a few days, but that's okay because you're going to get better. And you're going to get better quicker. The body will eliminate the virus quicker. Now, people make a big fuss about eating. Sometimes your mum will say, well, you need to eat when you're sick. But in actual fact, when you're sick, it doesn't matter. So if, you, if you're sick and you feel hungry, then eat. If you're sick, you probably won't feel hungry. Doesn't matter. Don't eat. A couple of days, absolutely fine. But whatever you do, 
keep drinking lots of water. Drink lots and lots of fluid. And you know you're drinking lots and lots of water because you're having big dilute wheeze. That's how you know you're producing dilute, light-colored urine. So keep drinking plenty, keep warm. Absolutely vital that you rest. Take it easy, lie on the couch, put on Netflix. Don't do any work. Don't even think about going out. And you also need to think about those around you. So if you're at home and there's other people at home, then really what you need to go is to go in one room, take your computer with you, take your phone with you, that's fine. Open the window in that room, but you keep warm and keep the door shut. So you're reducing the viral load to other people. So it's thinking about looking after yourself and looking after other people. In terms of medicines to cure this condition, unfortunately, right now, we don't know of any. People are experimenting with that. Now, if you get very, very short of breath, then you need to call for help. You need to call medical help if you're getting very short of breath, and then they'll advise you what to do. They may advise you to go in for testing. They may send someone around for testing. There'll be local medical facilities in the area you are in that will advise you on that. But otherwise, it's just a matter of letting people know, of course, but they'll probably just say, well, lie around for a few days and wait till you get better because we don't have any treatment for that. And don't take any treatment that someone suggests because we don't know. Only take a treatment if your doctor tells you to take it. Otherwise, it could be doing more harm than good. Awesome. So shortness of breath means that the lungs feel like they're not able to get enough oxygen. So what we were talking about before, can you show them your device, please? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. So you can get these little devices. <clears throat> so th these are seriously cool. Now, this is taking my pulse rate. And it's so you see that bar going up and down. I can't see this. Is that the right way around, Seth? It's upside down. It's upside down. Okay. <laughs> so what's the top number, Seth? 74. Right, 74 is my heart rate. So the 74 pulsations, see that bar going up and down? That is the pulse going through my finger. What's the second number, Seth? 97. 97, so that means my oxygen in my blood is 97% saturated. And that's okay. 95, 96, 97, 98, 99 is all, is all pretty cool. So that is oxygen saturation. So if the oxygen in the blood started to drop, you would certainly want to let a doctor know about that. Now, when people first get this virus, they can feel a bit short of breath. But if people get short of breath later on, especially in the second week, it's much more serious. You've got to let someone know. So if you are sick, talk to your doctor over the phone straight away. Let him know. And then he'll advise you on how you keep an eye on yourself. And if you can find out what your temperature is, so I've got one of these for taking temperatures. If you find out what your temperature is, that's good as well. Now, we have a different way of doing this in your country and my country. In my country, we use a scale called centigrade. So my, my temperature is 36.4 degrees centigrade, which is 98.2, I would think. Okay. <laughs> about, nine, about 98. No, 97.8, so about, about 98. So, so that's okay. And so knowing what your temperature is is good. If your temperature goes up, that's a fever. If it goes up a bit, that's fine. That's just your body fighting the infection. But there's nothing to worry about unless it becomes really, really high. And then your doctor will advise you what to do about it. But if you get a bit of a fever, hey, it's the most natural thing in the world. Don't worry about it. All right. I got two more. One yeah. is uh, vaping is very popular among some teenagers um, or smoking. What's wrong with that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, smoking, there's lots of things wrong with that because you get all sorts of pollutants into your lungs. It causes heart disease. It causes disease of the blood vessels. I've seen so many people get their feet chopped off, quite literally because they smoke. It causes heart disease. I've seen so many people die of heart attacks because they smoke. It causes cancer of the pancreas. I've seen many people die of that because they smoked. Lung cancer, of course, it causes all these things. But you know the key thing about smoking? It makes you look old. People that smoke have old looking skin. So if you want to look my age when you're 25, smoke. You'll increase and the chances about, of looking my age when you're 25. As far as a pulmonary or respiratory yeah. Um, uh, sickness, yeah. Um, does, does smoking or vaping make your body it's less 10, able 15. to, uh, your immune system? Weak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you've got inside your respiratory passage are these hairs called cilia. And they waft up the mucus. 
from your lungs. So the lo mucus is made down in your lungs, these things wafted up. Now, if you smoke or to some extent vape, then that is going to reduce the motility of these cilia. They're not going to waft properly. It's going to paralyze the cilia. And the that means all the gubbings. Stuff out. Yeah, you want to get it out. If in doubt, cough it out. Yeah. So all this stuff that should be coughed out is all left in your lungs and the infection stays down there with it. And we know that people that smoke are more likely to die of this disease. So smoking is worse than vaping and vaping is a lot worse than not doing anything. Okay. That's the current thinking. Vaping is probably going to be more dangerous than they think it is because it took us a long time to work out all these complications of smoking, why smoking was so dangerous. Vaping's only been going for a few years. But as we go along, we're learning more and more of the dangers of vaping. And the nicotine itself is a toxin, so really bad idea. So if you ever wanted a time to stop smoking, guys, this is it. You've got a real reason to stop smoking now. Okay. Difficult, but good time to do it. And then the last question is, what about kids who are in communities that have not been visibly impacted and getting mixed messages like it's a city thing? And Yeah, I'm sorry if you've been getting mixed messages. Let me be quite clear. This is a pandemic. This is going to go everywhere. If it's not in your area yet, it will be in your area soon. So, for example, people in the countryside of the United States up until last week thought they were going to be okay. They thought it was New York. They thought it was New Orleans. They thought it was uh, Washington State, uh, Seattle. They thought it was these places. But now it's known that this infection is in two thirds of all of the rural counties in the United States. Two out of three rural counties in the United States have diagnosed cases. And all the others have probably got cases, just that it's not diagnosed yet. So I'm afraid this is going to be everywhere. Whether you like it or not, for the next few weeks, this is your problem, just the same as it's my problem, just the same as it's Seth's problem. This is everywhere. It's a pandemic, I'm afraid. It will go away. We're going to get through it. But there's a few things we have to do in the meantime. Awesome. And do you have any final message that you want to give to to these students, these people who are our future and who are going to be, you know, the people who get an education and grow up and become yeah, yeah. solutions in this world. Are there any last messages you have for young? Yeah, people? sure. Well, anyone young is our future, but they're also our present as well. You're important today. Absolutely. This is about now. It's how we behave now. And this is your opportunity to really do that and to look back with pride that you did the right thing. And realize that it's not that you are going to come and do something in the future. You will, but you've got a chance to do something now, today. This is about the, the present, and we need everyone. This is going to be a team effort. This is team humanity versus the COVID-19 killer virus, and we have to move forward together on this. And if we do this, a lot more of us are going to survive than would have done if we mess this one up. So don't mess it up. Do the right thing. Let's move together as a team. Absolutely, together. Thank you, John. Dr. John Campbell can be found on YouTube. I've been following him every day um, for a few weeks now, and he, he's been so helpful to me. And just, John, thank you so much for um, being of service to kids in this video and to family. Very welcome, sir. And, Very welcome. And so generously offering <laughs> just giving updates um, that are useful and not sensationalized to people all around the world. If people act on it, Seth, it's all worthwhile. All right. But they've got, they've got to run with it. And my name is Seth Perler. If you're watching me on Dr. John's channel, you can find me at sethperler.com or on YouTube as well. With that, my friends, I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy. And uh, I hope you have a little bit of joy and peace in your heart today. And we'll see you soon. Take care. Take care.